Well, good morning. It is a gift to get to preach Jesus with you this morning. If you've been with us in the new year, then you know that we kicked off with a sermon series titled, I Am, Getting to Know Jesus from His Own Words, which led us into our current sermon series, The Final Verdict. As we get to know more of who we are because of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. As we get to slow down in this season of Lent, journeying with Jesus to the cross, looking at the trials of Jesus that led to his crucifixion. We've already talked about how in Jesus we are free and we are known. And today we're talking about how we are accepted in Jesus because he was rejected for us. So if you want to turn with me, we'll be in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 66. And if you are tired this morning, know that you are not alone. Not only am I with you, but as we jump into today's text, this is the third and final of Jesus' religious trials. He has been up all night long. It started with him praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, like we sang moments ago. Then he was taken before the former high priest, Annas, then taken before the current high priest Caiaphas and now he is dragged before the Sanhedrin which is the highest Jewish council and it's no small thing as there's about 70 of these guys and Jesus has not only withstood lies and insults that have been hurled at him all through the night but also beatings and literal punches it's safe to say it's been a long night for our Lord and Savior on our behalf So join me in Luke 22, starting in verse 66. At daybreak, all the elders of the people assembled, including the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. Jesus was led before this high council, the Sanhedrin, and they said, tell us, are you the Messiah? But he replied, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated in the place of power at God's right hand. They all shouted, so are you claiming to be the Son of God? And he replied, you say that I am. Why do we need other witnesses? They said, we ourselves heard him say it. Now this should sound familiar to last week, but there's a few differences. First of all, there's no language of Jesus destroying a temple here. This trial is all about Jesus' identity. And I know I just said that our I Am sermon series was supposed to be about Jesus' identity. And this is supposed to be about ours. But here's the truth. God gave us his word to show us who he is and how we can walk with him. So if we are faithfully preaching from God's own word every Sunday, then that means every single week we should be learning more about who God is and how we can walk with him together. And it's beautiful. The more we understand who God is, the better we can understand who we are in him and because of him. And so, when the Sanhedrin asks Jesus, tell us, are you the Messiah? They don't really want to know. There has been more than enough evidence and signs that Jesus is God's promised Messiah, anointed by God to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. But Jesus does not fit the Sanhedrin's preconceived ideas of who God is and what life with him is supposed to look like. Many, if not most Jews, including Jesus' own disciples, had a different idea of who the Messiah would be. Messiah is a political title. They really thought that God was going to send a Messiah to overtake the governing authorities that had been oppressing God's people for so long. But Jesus challenged their understanding of what and who the Messiah is. In Luke chapter 4, if you've been reading and dwell with us, you've already read this. When Jesus is in the synagogue, he takes a scroll of Isaiah and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Then he rolls up the scroll, hands it back to the attendant, sits down and says, the scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very 
day. Now anyone who knew their scriptures would have known that Isaiah's prophecy continues to say not only that the time of God's favor has come for the people of God, but the time of his wrath has come for their enemies. But Jesus didn't say that because Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. There's no denying Jesus is the Messiah. But their understanding of the Messiah was incorrect. It was not full. And so here, the Sanhedrin, y'all, they are the ones who spent their whole lives dedicated to the word of God and their understanding of the work of God. And here is God right before them and they don't see him and they don't hear him because he doesn't look and sound like what they expected. So when they ask if he's the Messiah, Jesus doesn't give them a straightforward answer because he's not the Messiah that they're thinking of. So he says, starting in verse 67, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. And we're gonna come back to that. That's our key verse today. But I really believe when we hear that, that's a call from Jesus today for us to really listen and believe him and for us to hear and respond in obedience to his will for us. Jesus says, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the son of man will be seated in the place of power at God's right hand. Notice he doesn't say, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, because they won't see. They're blind to who Jesus is. They refuse to believe who Jesus is right before them. They're rejecting him. And we cannot fathom the weight of these words in this place, with this people, in this time. But it is weighty enough that they are in a uproar, and understandably so, as they start screaming and shouting, so are you claiming to be the Son of God? And Jesus says, you say that I am. Now when Jesus says I am, that's the same I am, it's the same Greek ego I me that we talked about every week of the I am series this year. It's what God says to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus when Moses says, who will I say sent me? And God says, tell him that I am sent you for I am who I am and I will be who I will be. If there was anything lost in translation about Jesus being the Messiah, there is no room for misunderstanding about Jesus being the great I am, the son of God. In Luke's portrait of Jesus, we see that he sees Jesus as the son of God from beginning to end in Luke chapter one, when the angel Gabriel announces to Mary that Jesus is being born to Jesus' baptism and his genealogy that ends with Adam, the son of God, moving forward to Jesus being tempted in the wilderness to his transfiguration and now today before the Sanhedrin Jesus is and forever will be the son of God and he is quick and bold to associate with that truth that saves us I don't want us to miss how this ends the Sanhedrin says we why do we need other witnesses we ourselves heard him say it and we're about to turn together to Luke chapter 8, where Jesus says, pay attention to how you hear. But I want to go ahead and put those words out for us right now. Pay attention to how you hear. Like I said, when they say, if I tell you, you won't believe me, if I ask, you won't answer, I think that's something for us today. An invitation from Jesus to really listen and believe him for who he is and to hear and respond in obedience to his good, pleasing, and perfect will for our lives. Could it be that in the midst of these revival fires that are spreading across America right now, that Jesus is inviting us to believe him and obey him in a way we simply haven't before? It starts with listening to Jesus. It starts with truly hearing Jesus. So when I prayed about this, God took me to Luke chapter eight, which again, if you're in dwell with us, you should have read this week. I'm gonna challenge you to keep reading. 
today, this week, I, I challenge you and invite you and plead with you to sit there a little longer with today's message in mind. I'd love to read the whole parable that Jesus tells. Time just doesn't allow. But Jesus tells a famous parable of a farmer scattering seeds on different kinds of soil. And if you've heard it, maybe you're like me and I jump straight to the good soil. I want to be the good soil. Shouldn't we all be that? And I bypass verse 14 of Luke chapter 8. Jesus says, the seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so, they never grow into maturity. And if this does not speak to our current cultural reality, I do not know what does. That we hear God's word but immediately it's crowded out. Look at how many other things there are to do on our phone that we use to read the Bible. Look at how many other things are on our agendas for the day besides sitting in God's presence in prayer in his word and with his people. Though we may not use the words to admit it, our actions demonstrate our core belief that there are other people and other things that are more worth our time and affection and attention than God. Could it be that God saved us long ago and we are walking in this way that we are making for ourselves that we think is the good, pleasing, and perfect will for our lives and we're bathing it in the name of Jesus, but we have not sought God. We have not sought his word and we are not walking in the way in which he's leading because we're not even listening. We can't even hear him. Nonetheless, believe and obey him. Pay attention to how you hear What cares and riches and pleasures of this life are crowding out the word of God in your life today? And please know God is preaching to me just as much as he's preaching through me. It's a word for me today. Luke chapter 8, verse 15, Jesus talks about the good soil and what marks these good soil people. The seeds that fell on good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. Now, doesn't that sound a lot like listening and believing and hearing and responding in obedience? These people who hear God's word, cling to it, they hold fast to it for dear life, and they patiently produce a huge harvest. Now, if you were with us in the I Am series, you know we concluded with a message about Jesus being the true vine and that God is glorified when we produce much fruit, when we bear much fruit. Why is that? Because we can't do it on our own. We were not designed to. It is the Holy Spirit of the living God who lives in us, who have trusted in Jesus for life, forever who produces life-giving fruit in us. The fruit that he bears in us should bring life not only to us, but to others. So when we live lives like that, God is glorified because it is clear as day that we are connected to the vine, our source. And his character is being made known and manifest through our lives who he really is. Good soil people are those who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. Verse 18, Jesus says, so pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. Do you hear the Sanhedrin in that? Do we hear ourselves in that? But friends, if we listen to his teaching, he will give us more understanding, but it is his teaching that comes from his word that the Holy Spirit illuminates as truth for us and life for us. It's not my teaching. It's not your favorite podcast or the Instagram account you follow. It's his. Come to the source. Hear the word of God. Believe him. And by his grace, obey him. Pay attention to how you hear. They say, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are out here. They want to see you. And Jesus says in Luke 8, 21, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. Jesus defines his family as those who hear his word and obey it. It is both and, not one or the other, and it's all by his grace. Friends, are you in the family of God today? If you are, this is who we are. This is our purpose. Have we settled 
for less. We are fully accepted in Jesus and because of Jesus. I'm telling you that every bit of acceptance that we so deeply desire is already found fully by the God of all creation. I confess, and I assume I'm one of many in the room today, that I so often live for the acceptance and approval of other people besides God, and honestly, often instead of God. What would my life look like? What would your life look like if we lived like we actually believed the truth that we are already accepted in full in Jesus because of Jesus by the God of all creation? I think it'd give me the courage to believe him and obey him in a way I haven't before. Here's the thing. When you start believing God and you start obeying God, chances are, you're not going to be accepted by the world. And as our text tells us today, you may not be accepted by people who claim to be the people of God. But press on. Jesus didn't promise us that the world would accept us, quite the contrary. In John 15, he says, don't be surprised when the world hates you. Remember that it hated me first. But before he says that, he says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. Abide in my love. Friends, if we actually made a home in the reality that God so loved us that he sent his son to die for us so that we don't need to fear death, but we can live with him forever, that we are fully loved and totally accepted in him. I'm convinced we would believe Jesus and obey him in a way we haven't before. But it costs us to follow Jesus. And if you're like me, when Jesus asks me to obey him in a way that demands faith, it can be scary, certainly uncomfortable, and honestly, it doesn't make any sense to me at the time, and many others. It's so part of my own story. Last weekend, we hosted a local event for the IF Gathering. And if you're not familiar with that, it is a women's conference that Jenny Allen started about a decade ago in Austin. And what most people don't know is that I actually went through a few interviews to be one of her first unpaid interns to help launch that ministry initiative in Austin 10 years ago. One of my youth leaders growing up knew that I am called to communicate Christ, and she thought, what better way to be raised up and trained than to learn from this woman who has a similar calling? And so I applied. And halfway through my second video interview on Skype, anyone remember that? I had one of those bizarre moments, have you had it, where I'm both participating in my life, but also feel like I'm observing my life from a distance. It's so strange. Halfway through that second interview, I heard the voice of my good shepherd. And I said to this woman, I can't believe I'm saying this right now, but I really feel like God's telling me it's not the right time. I ended that interview with no greater ministry opportunity on the horizon. I remember when I told my youth leader my decision, she was not only surprised, but a little disappointed. So I started talking with God and praying with him and I thought, well, you know, Maybe it's not with the if gathering, but maybe you're still leading me to Austin. So I took a trip to Austin at the end of the summer. The first week of school was starting. I served with the Baptist student ministry at the University of Texas and helped them with their welcome week initiatives. And I met this girl named Becky on their staff. She'd just come back from serving as a journeyman with the International Mission Board and she challenged me to apply. She said no harm will come from applying. And so I did, and long story short, I then moved to Amsterdam. I was a university ministry catalyst through the journeyman program with the IMB. I thought God was leading me to Austin. Turns out he was leading me to Amsterdam. But what I didn't know, he was also leading me into the biggest storm of my life. As I was part of a really unhealthy team situation where I didn't have a voice, I didn't have a safe place, and no one really knew me, that'll wear on you over time. But the beauty is I got to know Jesus as my refuge. I never really needed to know him as that before. Wouldn't trade it for anything. That I'm known by him and I'm heard before him. Friends, I did not complete my term in Amsterdam. Hardest decision I've ever made in my life was deciding to resign and come back to the States. 
What did I fear most? People like me and you, the church. I feared that people would think I didn't care that these Dutch university students didn't know Jesus, but I cared so much. I came back more broken than I've ever been, but I'm convinced that if I'd stayed my full term in the IMB's eyes, not God's, I would have been in a deep darkness and depression that I thank God he rescued me from. Looking now, it made a whole lot more sense to move to Austin and work with Jenny Allen. But God's plan was better. God knew there were lessons I needed to learn. I needed to come to know him as my refuge. I needed to wrestle with my fear about what other people thought of me. I needed to see a cultural reality that has now hit the states. That on a near daily basis I would share the good news of Jesus and students would tell me I've never heard that before. No one's ever told me that before. Friends, if you think that the people around you know that Jesus loves them, you are gravely mistaken. Most likely they don't. Maybe they've heard his name, but they don't know that he loves them. We have not been communicating that message clearly. The message we were saved and sustained to proclaim. God knew. And isn't it ironic that I'm still standing before you here today doing precisely what God created me to do. Even though my journey didn't make a whole lot of sense to me and to some others. If we really believe God for who he is and we obey him as he is leading, it will cost us. But it's the only real way to walk. I do believe his will for us is good, pleasing, and perfect, and it may not seem so in our eyes, but I promise you it is in his. If you said yes to Jesus, you gave him yes for the rest of your life, why are you running now? <coughs> Jesus has been teaching me so much this year the importance of seeking. We see it in Exodus, like we talked about with Moses in the burning bush. That Moses could have kept on walking and ignored this strange thing that's happening, but instead he turned aside, he looks toward it, he seeks to find, and God meets him in the burning bush, speaks to him, reveals his name to him, and empowers him to set God's people free from slavery. Jesus is later known as the greater Moses. That's no small thing. In Acts, we see that God determines when the nations should rise and fall, and his purpose is that the nations would perhaps seek after him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. Jesus is not hiding, but he wants to be found. He wants us to seek him. Why does he say, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be given to you? You want to know why these revival fires are spreading? It starts with a posture of seeking God. Seeking his presence, seeking his voice, seeking his will in prayer, in scripture, in community. If it's happening there, why can't it happen here? I believe that God is inviting us to believe him and obey him in a way we simply haven't before. Pay attention to how you hear. Before we wrap up, I want to take us to a quick story you can find near the end of Luke's gospel in chapter 23, starting in verse 50. In fact, we meet this man in all four gospel accounts. His name is Joseph. He's a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. Luke 23:50 says, Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish high council that he had not agreed with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross, wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth, and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of rock. On the outside, it looks like Joseph is too late. And yet, we get to read his story today. Joseph, who had the courage to step out in faith, apart from the majority opinion of his own people, no matter the cost, 
to go before Pilate, request to take Jesus' body from the cross. He did. Wraps his body in linen and lies him not in a manger, but in a brand new tomb, likely reserved for him one day. Jesus is finally being treated as he deserves to be treated. When I was reading commentaries this week about Joseph of Arimathea, one said that Joseph is a man of good soil in whom the kingdom of God may grow. Isn't that beautiful? I pray you hear that invitation today. If you're continuing in our dwell reading, you're going to hear some heavy words from Jesus this week in Luke chapter 11. And I encourage you to remember today's message. As Jesus says, the queen of Sheba will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it. For she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now, someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. The people of Nineveh will also stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. May it not be said of us that we refuse to listen and we refuse to repent. Friends, if you can hear these words that God has written on my heart to share with you today, that means it is not yet too late for you to believe Jesus and to obey his will for you. I really believe he's inviting us to believe him and obey him in a way we simply haven't for before. So will you? Will you listen to Jesus? Will you believe God's word for you? And will you respond in obedience to God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for you? In Christ Jesus, we are entirely accepted. What do you say we start living like it? If ever there was a time, it's right now. Will you pray with me? God, I confess for myself, and I believe on behalf of so many in this room, that I have sought the acceptance and approval of so many people besides you and instead of you. Thank you for your forgiveness and your grace. I confess that I have bypassed time with you in your presence, in your word, in prayer, and with your people, because I guess I just feel like I already know you. Forgive me, thank you for your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, We need you, we need your word, and we need these kind of good soil people who continue to hear your word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. Will you help us? Help us to listen and believe you. Help us to repent and receive your forgiveness. And help us to hear you and respond in obedience your good, pleasing, and perfect will for us. Jesus, what are you wanting to show us about who you are? What steps of faith are you inviting us to take hand in hand with you? Oh, by your grace, may we believe and obey. In your name, amen.